A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We ask you, brothers and sisters, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of our assembling with him, not to be shaken out of your mind suddenly or to be alarmed either by the Spirit or by an oral statement or by a letter from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no one deceive you in any way. To this end, he has also called you through our gospel to possess the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good hope through his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good deed and word. Verbum Domini. The Lord comes to judge the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He made the world firm, not to be moved. He governs the peoples with iniquity. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and what fields resound. Let the plains be joyful and all that is in them. Then shall all the trees of the forest exult. Before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to rule the earth. He shall rule the world with justice and the people with his constancy. Dominus Fobiscum. Et Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Gloria Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier things of the law, judgment and mercy and fidelity. But these you should have done without neglecting the others, blind guides who strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of a cup and dish, but inside they are full of plunder and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, Cleanse the first, the inside of the cup, so that the outside also may be clean. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate the memorial of St. Augustine, Bishop and Doctor of the Church. 
It is no coincidence that the memorial of St. Monica, St. Augustine's mother, was celebrated yesterday. As Father Anthony mentioned yesterday, it was the persevering prayer of a parent that eventually led to the conversion of her son. Like St. Monica, I am sure that many of our viewers have children that are wandering like lost sheep and are stuck in the lure of this passing world. These two saints together can be a model for you to never give up on your children. They teach us that there is always hope, even for those who may seem to be the worst of sinners. In reading St. Augustine's Confessions, one can see that conversion is not just an event that happens once and it's all over. St. Augustine shows us that conversion is a path or a journey to discovering the truth. He shows us that conversion is going to look different for each one of us. Conversion, our conversion is not going to, look, going to look exactly like St. Augustine's or St. Thomas's or, say, St. Margaret or Cortona. Pope Benedict XVI said that throughout the history of Christianity, the Lord has sent us models of conversion so that we may orient ourselves by looking at their example. Conversion always involves a turning away from something and a turning toward something else. In all cases, it is a turning away from sin and the attachments of this world and a turning toward God. In St. Augustine's life and in our lives as well, this is not an overnight change, as we all know, but is a daily struggle. During one of his struggles with the Lord, he heard a child singing over and over again, Tola lege, Tola lege, which means take and read, take and read. He took up a copy of the scriptures and opened it randomly to St. Paul's letter to the, to the Romans, chapter 13, which reads, Not in revelry or drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. It was when St. Augustine was in his 30s that he encountered the preaching of St. Ambrose of Milan. And before meeting him, St. Augustine, who was a rhetorician and philosopher, had great difficulty understanding the Old Testament because of its lack of rhetorical beauty or its lofty philosophical content. Ambrose brought a new awareness to the way Augustine would look at the Old Testament. Ambrose used a method, method called typology, which points to persons, places, and things in the Old Testament in order to show us how God was preparing his people for his son, Jesus Christ. So when we look at the Old Testament, we can see glimpses of how God was preparing his people for the coming of his son. Jesus Christ became the lens, so to speak, of how to interpret the Old Testament. The entire Old Testament, as we can see throughout it, was a gradual journey, just like conversion is a gradual journey toward the revelation, the full revelation of God's only begotten Son, Jesus. 
A title that St. Augustine is esteemed for in the church is the Doctor of Grace. His teaching on grace, which is the indwelling of the Holy Trinity in the soul, is spread all throughout his writings. His autobiography, The Confessions, is perhaps one of the greatest articulations of how grace works through nature, or how grace builds on nature. It is St. Augustine's own personal account of his interior life and of his personal relationship with God and how he battled sin in his own life. And interestingly, he writes his autobiography as if he were writing it directly to God, not so much for the benefit of, of a later reader, but he wrote it for his own benefit, of his own relationship with Christ. This famous quote from the Confessions can be said to summarize St. Augustine's teaching on grace. Late have I loved ye, you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. You were within me, but I was outside. It was there that I searched for you. In my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things which you created. You were with me, but I was not with you. Created things kept me from you, yet if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called, you shouted, you broke through my deafness, you flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you, now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. It was grace that was working within him, even though he did not know it, even though he did not recognize it. Grace was working in him without him. It was grace that was drawing St. Augustine back to God. It was not so much that Augustine found God, but it was God that found Augustine. He realized that the very things that kept him from God would not have existed if they weren't being sustained by God. Just the fact that we exist means that God is sustaining us and is within us. But that doesn't always mean that we are in friendship with him. The key phrase is when he says, you were within me, but I was not with you. This is a recognition that, that, that there was not a friendship with God, a communion of life and of love. It was, one, it was once St. Augustine cooperated with grace and allow God to work within him freely, that, he, that did he know what it meant to be in friendship with God. And when this happened, there was a hunger and a thirst that could only be quenched by God. St. Augustine gives us the model of allowing grace to work in our, each one of our lives. In all of us, God acts in us without us, bringing us to repentance and conversion. So first, God acts in us without us, that's actual grace, bringing us to repentance. It's not like one day I decided I was going to convert or repent, but God is the initiator. God is the actor. He acts in us without us. 
Then God acts in us, with us, bringing us to a deeper friendship with him. And this is ongoing. God acts in us, with us, bringing us closer to a deeper friendship with him. And finally, God acts in us, through us, bringing us to the completion of the grace that he first started within us. So remember, it first started with an actual grace, God acting in us without us, and then God acting in us with us through our cooperation, and then he brings to completion the grace that he first started without us. May each of us come to the same awareness that the risen Christ uttered to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you.